In this video, we will explain something about the construction of hypothesis tests and in particular, particular the construction of hypotheses and what impact this has on uh, what we can learn from a test. And we will also show a little simulation in Excel that hopefully helps to illustrate how we have to think about decisions in a hypothesis test. So let me show you this little picture. So when we do hypothesis tests, we, we do something fairly crude. We, we divide the world of possibilities into two camps. Possible outcomes are either, or possible truths even, are either part of the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. And then we make a decision as part of the hypothesis test and there we either do not reject H0 or we reject H0 and therefore find support for HA. So let's put an example to this to, to illustrate that better. You could ask the question, is a new medication safe? Okay, so when new medications are developed, one of the first questions is always, does it actually do any harm? Does it have side effects that are potentially very harmful? And so let's formulate some hypothesis. Let's say, H0 and HA. H0 is, uh, it is safe, or we'll just say safe, and the alternative is not safe. Now, how should we think about that? When you do uh, develop new medication, you'll usually do something, this is called like a randomized control trial, where you have a control group and a treatment group. And the control group, they get a placebo, so they also get some pills, but there's nothing in that. And then the treatment group actually gets the new medication. And it's designed such that the people don't actually know whether they get the placebo or um, the medication. So, and then let's think about how, how could new medication harm that, of course, depends very much on, um, on the circumstance on the medication. But let's say the developer of the medication is a little bit concerned of whether it will cause perhaps higher blood pressure. Okay, and that may be unhealthy for the people uh, who, take it, who take the medication. And you don't really want that. So the question is, does it have higher blood pressure? So what we do is, typically we would take uh, samples here We'll take samples here, let's say X bar of the control group and X bar of the treatment group of perhaps blood pressure of the people who either take the placebo or take the medication. And of course we know the sample means not the same as the population mean, so there may be population mean mu C and population mean mu T. So for simplicity, let's assume we know that this is 100. Okay, in the population, the average blood pressure, however it's measured, is equal to 100. So that means H0 safe would mean that the mean in the treatment group is the same as the mean in the control group, let's say 100. And you're worried about that blood pressure on average in the treatment group actually being larger than 100. So it would mean that taking the medication comes with some risks. So when we do the hypothesis test, we can take one of two decisions in the end. We either do not reject H0, so we stick with H0, or we reject H0 and sort of accept the alternative hypothesis. If in truth the medication is safe and we decide to not reject H0, everything is honky-dory, everything is fine. <coughs> Excuse me. If in truth, the medication is not safe or increases the blood pressure and our decision of in the hypothesis test decides that we should reject H0, so we accept in favor of HA, then we've done the right decision, we've taken the right decision as well. However, there are two possible mistakes we could make. We could, for instance, reject a correct H0 so that's when we're in this little field here. And this is what we call the type one error, type one error. 
And in our case, that would be, or what would that mean is, we would basically reject safe medication. Safe medication. So there's potentially, we develop that medication to actually perhaps protect ourselves against something or save uh, some illness. But we'll say, well, perhaps we, we are not going to develop that because it doesn't seem to be safe. It does seem to have high or potentially problematic side effects. So that's rejecting safe medication. That would be the type 1 error here because we are rejecting a correct null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is the medication is safe. If, however, in truth, the medication is not safe, however, our test decides to not reject the null hypothesis. This is what we call a type 2 error. And what's the consequence of that in this example? Well, that is that we would develop a potentially unsafe medication. Okay, so we would, people who take that medication would be harmed. So in a particular example, you have to think about which of these two errors may be more problematic. In this particular example, one may quite well argue that it's this one, the type 2 error, developing medication that potentially harms a lot of people. Although it may be that we are rejecting the development of a medication which is safe. Now you have to think even more specific about the, the example. How, um, how harmful is the illness we are trying to protect? Are there alternative medications which are perhaps safe? Okay, so even in this example, we can't really discuss in all generality which error is more important to avoid. But this is the sort of thinking you have to show. Let's do a little simulation study to understand more about these decisions and when we make mistakes and when we not make mistakes and what influences the probability of making these two mistakes. So here we have a spreadsheet. Well, let me make that a little bit bigger. This spreadsheet will be made available uh, from your lesson or from a link in the, um, in the notes to this video. What do we see here in this video? So I'm using a slightly different example, a bit sort of uh, related. So let's think about we are measuring daily calorie intake through vegetables, okay? How, how much of your daily intake comes from, from vegetables? And let's say we have a control group there here in B and we have a treatment group here in C. And what we have here, let me change that for a moment, what we're interested in whether some sort of intervention actually makes people take in more calories through vegetables. So that may be a, some sort of advertising campaign. It may be that perhaps some people are given extra money to buy fresh fruit and vegetable. It could be all sorts of policies. Right? I'm not going to say what that policy is here. And these data are, of course, all simulated. So here we now have in the population, we're having two groups, a control group and a treatment group. So a group which doesn't get that intervention and the treatment group. And let's say it's some randomized controlled trial. So random, it's random whether you are part of the controlled group or the treatment group. And let's think of there being a thousand people. So I have up to a thousand people here in each of these two, the control and the population group. Let's say this is the population. So in reality, you will never see all of this population data. In reality, all you see is a sample. And here is now the setup. These data are randomly simulated. By default, the data here are all averaged around 800 and we have a standard deviation of 100. So what these numbers are here, they are random draws from a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 100. By default, exactly the same for both control and for treatment group. And you can see how this is done, but that's not important here. 
So, for starters here, I assume that the effect of the experiment is zero. That means whatever treatment the treatment group got, got has no impact on their calorie intake through vegetables. So, what are we going to do now is, now we're going to simulate taking samples. So, think about sample one here. Let me just uh, perhaps highlight that. So, sample one will go all the way over here. So, you see there's actually quite, quite a lot. Let me just do that in yellow. So, yellow is just sample one, so we can see it a little bit better. Sample one. If you took one sample, you perhaps took random draws from this treatment group. Okay, and let's say again, we're only, let's say we know that on average in the population, the intake is 800 on average with a standard deviation of 100. So we're just thinking about the treatment group here. This is a sample from the treatment group. Again, you can investigate the spreadsheet to see how I draw that sample from the treatment uh, group. Okay? But these are observations, 807, 827, 1003. These are some random draws from these observations here. Then I calculate a mean, a sample mean of that sample. Okay. Then I calculate a set value. What's that set value? It's that sample mean. Let me actually make that a little bit bigger so you can see it. So that set value here takes the sample mean, subtracts 800, and divides by the standard error of the sample mean. That's the standard deviation in our population divided by the square root of the sample size. The sample size is determined here and we can change that in a moment. Let's actually change it right now. Let's start with a sample size of 30. Okay, so whenever you change anything, all the random numbers are redrawn. So you always get new random numbers. So here in that sample, we have a sample mean of 821, almost 822. That gives us a set value of 1.19 and that gives us a probability so this is the p-value of that test, a probability that if, in truth, the mean is 800, the probability of getting a sample mean in a sample of 30 of 821.8 or more, more extreme, so it's a one-sided test, is around 11.5%. So if you then do a, a hypothesis test, you have to decide whether you should not reject or reject. Here we use, for starters, a significance level of 0.1. Since this p-value is larger than 0.1, we do not reject this test. So we could, if you enter any value in any free field and press enter, we are getting a new random draw. So now, Sample one has changed. Now the sample average, sample means 815 approximately, set value is that, and the p-value is 0.21. Okay. So what we now do is, in reality, all you have is one sample. And here in this case, you would not have rejected. What I want to illustrate in this spreadsheet is how we have to interpret this if you only have one sample this do not reject decision. So to illustrate that, what I actually do is, we're taking 1,000 samples. So you can see here, that was sample one, but we are actually having 1,000 samples, all of sample size 30. And you see for each sample, we have different sample means, therefore different set values, and therefore different p-values. And you can see this, so sample 14 here, we have a sample mean of 831, a set value of 1.7, set test statistic, and therefore a p-value of 0.04. So if our significance level is 0.1, that means we are rejecting the null hypothesis. And what I then do is, out of these 1,000, I calculate, and that's what we see in this table, what proportion of these significant uh, hypothesis tests made us not reject the null hypothesis. In this case, that's 
around 92% and what proportions made us reject the null hypothesis. So that is here around 7 or around 8%. So the very important thing now to understand is that if we make, if we create a significant uh, hypothesis test at a significance level of 0.1, then we should expect to make a type 1 error, and that is this one here, rejecting a correct null hypothesis. Remember here, the null hypothesis is true because our experimental effect is zero. So the treatment group has no, uh, the, the intervention has no effect. So H naught is that mu is equal to 100. So if you test that at a significance level of 0.1, then we should expect to reject the correct null hypothesis approximately 0.1 in 10% in of cases. Okay, so that's 10%. And here in this experiment, that's exactly what happened. Okay, it's around 10.6%. If you type in just a number and press enter here in that field, you get new random draws and you, we get a new number. But you see now with these new random draws, we rejected the correct null hypothesis in 9% of cases. And let's do it once more. Now in this case in 19%, right, once more, now 12%. So if you do that several times, you see this number is gonna be varying around 10%. If we change the significance level and change that to say 1%, then we, it will be harder to reject the null hypothesis. And we see, as we repeat this, you can see that now the type, the proportion of tests where we make a type one error now varies around 1%. Okay, so we should expect to make an incorrect decision 1% of times. So this is what that significance level does. Okay, and you should note that changing the sample size should not change that. So we worked with a sample size of 30. Let's increase that to 100. Okay, so remember that number should vary around 1%. That red number here, that should vary around 1%. Okay, and it indeed varies around 1%. So changing the sample size doesn't make a difference here. So this is all now where the truth was that H0 was correct. Let's change that. Let's make the truth HA, the alternative hypothesis, the intervention, what we said, some advertising campaign to say, hey, eat more vegetables, flyers through doors, or perhaps even some money to buy uh, fresh food has an effect. Let's say it has an effect of on average 20 calories. So I type the experiment effect here and what you can see here now, the mean from which I draw the treatment group values has increased from 800 to 820. So the effect is 20 calories per day, more vegetable intake. So I've just coded the spreadsheet such that these numbers now appear in the HA row. Otherwise the same, so we are sample size of 100, significance level of 1%, and now we want to see what we do. So it turns out here that we are rejecting the null hypothesis, in this case, 40% of times. That means 40% of times we make the correct decision. However, in still 60% of cases, we make an incorrect decision, a type one error. Now you can see, let's see how this changes now. If for instance, we decrease the sample size. What you now see is that the probability of making a type two error, so not rejecting an incorrect null hypothesis increases. And we're making the correct decision in fewer cases. Right? So let's just repeat that a number of times. So you can see that we're having, we're making a lot of type two errors. 
So how can you avoid making type 2 errors? Well, if you increase the sample size. So let's increase it back to 100. And now you can see that we're making more correct decisions. Okay, but still, there's still a lot of type 2 errors we do. Now, why is that? Well, think about the experiment effect. We said it was 20, on average 20 more, but the standard deviation is actually 100. So it's the effect is like a fifth of a standard deviation. Let's make the effect larger. Let's make it, let's make it, turn it to 100. So now you see if the effect size is 100, one standard deviation, now you see that at the significance level of 1%, sample size of 100, we always make the right decisions. Look at these set values. They're all around 10 here. All right? So in, well, even if I draw new random numbers, there's no difference here. What happens if we decrease the sample size? Well, we still basically always make the right decision. Uh, almost always. So there is rare occasions here where we don't make the right decisions. Well, if you have such a big effect size, even at a sample size of 10, you're making a lot of correct decisions. Okay, so how much, how often you make a type 2 error depends to a huge degree on that experiment effect. Of course, that's nothing in your control. That's just what you're after. You want to know, do we have an experiment effect? Okay. Now, of course, what we haven't changed yet now is that significance level. Let's change the significance level. So we have uh, an experiment effect of 100, sample size of 10. Now we have a significance level of 0.01. Let's say we change that to five. Okay, so let's change that to five. What you see now, we are making fewer, we are making fewer type two errors. Okay, so increasing the significance level, not making any other changes reduces the type probability of making a type 2 error. Let's put it back to 1% to see that. Okay, and now let's draw random numbers. So you see our probability of making a type 2 error has increased. So what is under your control as a researcher? The experiment effect is not under your control. In fact, that's what you, you want to find out. Is there an effect? Okay, is that mu of the treatment group actually larger than 800? So that's what you want to find out. What is under your control is the sample size and the significance level. Everything else being equal, larger sample sizes are better. Okay, because so you see, let's increase that sample size. We are now operating under HA being true, so is, there is an effect. Increasing the sample size will reduce the type 2 error. Okay, and here, possibly at 50, we are already getting no type 2 error. Let's go back to a sample size of 10 for beginner, for starters. Let's go to no effect, the null hypothesis. Here we are at significance level of 1%. So you see, even at the sample size of 10, our type 1 error will stay around 1%. Can we reduce that with the sample size? No. Okay, that is how we calibrate our test. So that will always still stay around 1%. So increasing the sample size does not change the type 1 error. It always stays around your significance level. Increasing the sample size, however, makes it less likely to make a type 2 error. The same, let's go into, let's say, an experiment effect of 50. So we're in the world of the alternative hypothesis. You can reduce the type 2 error in two ways. Either 
by, let's start again with a sample size of 10. Okay, so now we have very substantial type 2 error. You can decrease that in two ways, either by increasing the sample size, or let's go back to 10 as the sample size, or by increasing the significance level, okay, or even go to 0.1. So why is that important to understand? Let's go back to our example. If it is very important for you to avoid making a type two error because you think that is a very dangerous mistake to make, then what do you want? If you want to avoid type two errors, you should increase the sample size and increase the alpha because that will either of these will reduce the probability of a type 2 error right, so that is extremely important to understand when you do hypothesis testing